Lord, we thank you today for your presence, and we ask that you would anoint the word of the Lord, may bring profit to our life and create in us, Lord, a greater purpose of your kingdom. Lord, I humble myself under your hand this morning, and I yield myself to your Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and touch deep within our hearts with your word. Amen. Everybody say it. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you, worship team. We love you guys. You're so awesome. Turn over your Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalms 132. This morning, I want to revisit a little bit more about the Feast of Tabernacles, the time of Sukkot, as it's called in Hebrew. Learning the understanding, the different feasts has really been part of our Christian experience since way back in the 70s. Understanding that we're not doing the feast in a in a way that we would think that would draw merit from God, but understanding that the Lord Jesus still uses how the feasts work in our lives, not only for the children of Israel, but for the body of Christ. And when we look at the Feast of Sukkot, we look at the time of dwelling. Keep that in your heart and your mind this morning, the word dwelling, because it's important where you live. It's important where you hang out, right? And the Lord wants you to hang out with him. Everybody say, he's, he's a good buddy to hang with. He's a good man to get to know. And so this principle of abiding in the time of Sukkot, and I wanted to get into some of the things last week that I'm going to get into this week, but I'll be honest with you, I kind of got the spirit of preach on me last week. And... Uh, this morning I'm praying for the spirit of teach or a mixture thereof, combination of two, right? I, I sometimes think I get more enthusiastic than is good for me. Um, you don't think so? Yeah. Uh, in fact, some of my enthusiasm freaks me out. How many have ever had a freak out moment in your life? When you, you did and said things that you really surprised you, and then you think, why did I say that? Well, that's the way I live. I live in that place called freak out. So now you understand why Sue has a lot of grace. And uh, in a year and a half from now, maybe a year and three months, Sue and I will be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. Amen. By the grace of God, we'll still be here then, right? And um, I'm believing the Lord to take Sue back to Maui for the 50th anniversary in January of 2019. Wouldn't that be nice? i got to quit talking about Hawaii or I'll be Hawaii dreaming during the message. I'm sure you'd rather have something with more substance than a little travel itinerary about Hawaii, or maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you would like to have that this morning. Amen. I did tell you this. The first time I ever went to, we went to Maui, and we, back in around 2000, I, whenever it was, we went out one of these boats, and there's nothing like having a big humpback whale come out of the ocean within a few feet of where you're sitting in a boat. It's very frightening. Anyone ever had that happen? Yeah, it it really it really awakens your senses, <laughs> and it it makes you realize the, how fragile <laughs> we really are, <laughs> but no, and and how amazing those whales are that they can time their breach so perfectly to keep from killing a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I think they actually like us, or they would probably kill us, right? Yeah. So thank God for that. 
So I want to talk about the seven things this morning that the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh feast of the seventh month, really means to us. Because we know that the Feast of Tabernacles is a feast of accumulation, where we accumulate and we come to the place of fulfillment. And I I think that we understand in the body of Christ in this hour, there, there is coming a day called the day of fulfillment, the day of completion, the day where it's finished. In fact, in Hebrews, it says, that the Lord said that my work is finished. I've finished this thing. I've completed it. And you and I are in a process of of being finished, completed. Scripture says that he is the, the master builder. He is the potter. We're the clay. So God is forming, shaping, fashioning us into his image to complete us we may be found complete in Christ, lacking nothing. And that's part of maturity, isn't it? Maturity is the process of maturation of finished work. See, Christ finished his work. We readily accept that, don't we? That Christ finished his work. But then we also must accept that our work is being finished as well. Because it's a two-pronged application Because what Christ did simply opened the door to create what you can do, what you can become. And we've talked about that recently a lot. It's not about what we're doing. It's about who we're becoming. That really defines us, doesn't it? Our life is not defined by our activity or our works, even though works and activity are a product of what we become. But our life is primarily defined by who we are, what we become, because it's out of that transformation of who we are that who he is is revealed through us. His works, his words, his nature, everything that Christ is is revealed through us. And we looked last week, and I want to read some of this morning, Psalms 132, and Guys, I'm going to be going to a lot of scripture, so if you can possibly follow along, uh, I'd appreciate doing that on the board. If not, then look at your device, your Bible, or whatever, and uh, phone, and find the scripture. Okay, Psalms 132, uh, David was speaking this in verse 3, Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house, nor to the comfort of my bed, and not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. So the Psalms 132 is towards the end of what we call the Psalms of Ascent. When the children of Israel were taken captive into Babylon, they quickly adapted to the Babylonian culture. The scripture then from this point, at point forth, refers to it as a Babylonian spirit. It's the spirit of the world that marries the church so that it creates a passivity in the church to settle for what the world dictates that it will accept from the church. See, there's only so much the world will accept from us in our fervency for God before they get upset. Do you realize that? As long as the church isn't that fervent, the world is not bothered by us. But when there's a people that arise and actually begin to believe God, that he will restore everything to the world through the church, it begins to be a challenge to the world. Because we understand the world is built upon foundations that aren't as sure and true as the foundations that God is building within us. What God is building within you is an incredible foundation, a place where he can dwell, he can abide, he can reveal, and he can be brought forth upon the earth. And so in their captivity in Babylon, they begin to merge in with the same spirit of the Babylonian people. And even though they were in slavery, the Babylonians 
liberated them enough to where it made their slavery acceptable. But then all of a sudden, the Lord began to speak through the prophets. Everybody say, "Uh uh-oh. Because usually when the word of the Lord begins to come through the prophetic anointing, it becomes disruptive. Because it challenges us on every level that we live on that's not pleasing to God. To bring us back to the place where the main thing becomes the main thing. And the main thing to those that had the vision was that the Lord wanted to rebuild his temple in Jerusalem that had been destroyed so there would be a place where God could abide and the people could worship. So the Psalms of Ascent is the journey starting in Psalms 120, and I preached a whole series on this. Carl, you still need to send me that manuscript. I, we've, all, we've put them in manuscript form. We're going to come out with another book here eventually. It, the, the first book was called Show Me Thy Glory. This book is going to be called The Steps to Glory. 15 steps. The book Psalms 120. We know them as the Psalms of Ascent. It's not something I've made up. It's something that many preached for many generations. But in this beautiful Psalm of Ascent, we see this progressive unfolding of God's people hungering to be back in the presence of the Lord. And the first thing they did was that they began to turn from the deception that was keeping them bound. Said, Lord, deliver us from the deception. Deliver us from the lying tongues that are keeping us in captivity. And so it said that only a small group, how many was it, one out of, someone knows the answer. I know the answer, but I forgot. One out of a thousand, one out of a hundred, but only a remnant of the people began to hear the prophets. And so only a small remnant of the people came out of Babylon while the rest remained there. They, now, they were still Jews, Israelis. They were still people of the covenant. They were still people that had a promise made to them. They were still people that God called the apple of his eye even though they remained in Babylon. But yet there was a remnant that began to hear that, hey, we can come back to this place of dwelling. We can come back to this tabernacling experience that God wanted the people of Israel to have, where we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so this Psalms 132 is is them reciting the, the heart of David, Well, it said, Lord, remember David, in verse 1, and all of his afflictions, how he swore to God and bowed to the mighty God of Jacob, verse 2. Surely I will not go into the house of my, the house of my, chamber of my house, or go into the comfort even of my own bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes, slumber to my eyelids, until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty God of Jacob. Now, this is a psalm of ascent, they were singing on the pathway back to establish the temple of God in Jerusalem. Saying there was something in their spirit that was crying out, saying, this is how we want to be. This is, David was this way. This is our way as well. We want to dwell in the house of the Lord. We want to come so we can worship the Lord at his footstool. We want to come back to this place where the the place that God has chosen. It says in verse 13, God has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. Put your hand on your heart with one of your fingers, this finger preferably, and say, the Lord has chosen this place for a habitation. Wow. That the glory of God could actually live in you. That's amazing, isn't it? See, but the way that it happens is that God has already chosen it for you. It's already a foregone conclusion that God said it's finished. I've chosen this path for you. So it's not on his part any holding back or any reservation in his choice of you. It says many are chosen. Many. In fact, I think it's a, we could say all are chosen. All are called, but how many 
move in to the place where it actually happens in their life. And I think the Lord is calling to the church in this hour. I know he's calling my heart, and I believe yours. And hopefully in the entire body of Christ, there's this a call saying, okay, let's dwell with the Lord. Let's come back to the covenant of God until he establishes Jerusalem as a praise upon the earth. That's, that's where we're at. And so in this feast, in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verse 23, I want to read this scripture to you. It said, three times in the year, all your men shall appear before the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. For I will cast out the nations before you. I will enlarge your borders. Neither will any man covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times a year. It's kind of like the Beatles songs, right? What is it, three times? What's that? What? Oh, eight days a week. Eight days a week. We're going to call it three, three days a week. Okay. Three days a week. Yeah. Did I ever tell you the first time I ever heard the Beatles? Now, this might date me a little bit, but I was in a rock band. It was called the Four Speeds. And I was more limber back then than I am now. I played bass guitar. I actually could put the bass guitar behind my back and play a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. We'd play a little bit that way, but we didn't keep it back there very long. And then we'd put it out here like this, you know, and we'd dance and we'd twirl around like that. And uh, called the Four Speeds. And... So I was a little bit into music, even though music really wasn't much ever into me, <laughs> unfortunately. But if, if we're together in eternity, you, I guarantee you I'm going to be singing the loudest because I know God will give me the voice that I really desire in eternity. How many feel the same way, right? You're not, maybe you're not necessarily blessed with the greatest voice, but you know that one day everything will be made whole in our life. So... I'm driving, uh, and I believe it's 1963. I'd have to check, but I, I parked at the stoplight. I'm like a sophomore in high school, and I had the radio on, and I want to hold your hand came on the radio. Swear to God, I'm fixing to tell you the truth. How many think, well, we appreciate the pastor raising his hand and saying, he has to swear that he's telling the truth this time. What are you telling us the rest of the time, right? I said out loud, that music will change music. I said it out loud the minute I heard the Beatles sing because it was something revolutionary and, and transformative in what they were singing. It really began to set the stage for the whole new age because it was from that moment forth that everything in our society and our music began to change, 1964. That was before the uh, Haight Ash Ashbury, all that stuff in San Francisco. But there was something that resonated in my spirit when I, when I heard that. And I don't know really why I said that this morning, but I, hopefully I can get back to what I was talking about. Three times a year. Okay, that was how that happened. You guys are so distracting. Quit distracting me. Yeah, but every now and then you like a little history lesson, right? Yeah, you really do. And believe me, all you people that think, boy, that was a romantic time back in the 60s, um, to live back then, it really wasn't. It was just like any other time. It was mostly chaos from about 66 to 70. But we won't go into all that. Okay. Um, so the, the Lord says, this is a feast that you come up to me and I'm going to bring you into a place where you're safe. Isn't it amazing when we come into the presence of the Lord he brings a spirit of peace and safety to us 
Because when, when you're in the house of God, when you're enacting God in that covenant that God has given you, and that assurance that comes, the assurance of knowing the Lord, there's something about it that it literally dispels every spirit of fear, anxiety off of your life. See, when we're apart from God, we're always in turmoil. But when we're in the house, when we're in the presence, when we're in the fullness of the Lord, there's something that cannot destroy us. No man that covets our land, no nation that would come against us, nothing that would happen will destroy the bond that God gives us. So I, I thank the Lord this morning that he is bringing us into this place of unity and safety. You know, the book of John says that, that, in the, that the Lord said, I want them, Lord, to have the same glory that you've given me. I want them to be one with you just as I am one with you. And I want you to be them to be one with one another. See, when the glory of God comes through the hungry heart that enters into it, it connects you to the Father which is in heaven. Because we understand the principle of, of this dwelling is not simply our desire to dwell with the Lord, but his overwhelming desire to dwell with you. The purpose of love is not simply to forgive you and liberate you, but the purpose is to love is to connect you to him. He loves you more than just to forgive you. That's a lot of love, isn't it? See, it's not hard to love someone enough when I forgive you. But it's another thing to love them and say, I forgive you and I want to be one with you. That's true love, isn't it? I mean, I can forgive the vilest of sinner. Oh, you're forgiven, brother. But if, what, what is what, to take that sinner next to me and say, hey, I want to be one with you, that's another story, isn't it? See, l true love creates true unity because it not only reaches to forgive, but it reaches to include and to bring in. And that's why the Father loved you so much he gave you Christ so that he could capture your heart, capture your relationship to him. Wow. This great unity that Ephesians talks about. It said, God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And we usually stop there. But it, the real meat of it goes on where he says, until we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness which is in Christ Jesus. See, that's where the Lord's bringing us. And it precedes that in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, till you come to the unity of the Spirit. And then it goes on to say, then now you come to the unity of the faith. When a man and a woman enters into a tabernacling experience, it creates a unity with the Most High God. Because he becomes, he is in you, and you are in him. Now you're one together. Same heart, same mind, same spirit. You're totally immersed into who he is, and he's totally immersed into who you are. Just as God is so invested in you, you become invested in him. I am one with the Father. That's the great prayer in Israel, isn't it? Hear, O God, the Lord God is one, and we're one with him. And this was the cry of the children of Babylon, children of Israel captured in Babylon. Let us go back to the house of of the Lord to this dwelling place. And this, when God instigated the tabernacling in the, the wilderness, he was saying, now I want you to build these booths. I want you to take the, 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 the leaves, the myrtles, the leafy brows, and bring them, build you a booth. I want you to dwell in this sukkah, suko, suko with me during this day of sukkah. I want you to come into this place of dwelling. Because this is where I am, to be with you. I want you to be with me. I want you to be with me, and I want to be with you. This is God's desire, was to have this intimate relationship with you, to bring you into this unity with him. Thank you, Lord, today. 
So you, you, it makes you understand a little bit and then more about my motivation. It's never been to build a church just to build a church. It's to build a people. It's to build a heart. It's to build a habitation for the Lord. Because it's never been, and it never can be, about the numbers. It always has to be about the connection that God gives us. Many years ago, 1989, the Lord spoke to me. He said, we we're going through a great trial. And in the midst of that, the Lord said, you can build the biggest house you want to build, but unless I build the house, you're going to labor in vain. Because I realized then is that the Lord's not looking for numbers. Are numbers important? Yes, but that's not his motivation. His motivation is relationships. And in the relationship, the numbers will come. You see, when Christ came to the earth, he didn't try to build a crowd. He had a crowd for a while, but then he lost the crowd. <laughs> but Christ came for three and a half years, and his, most of his labor and most of his giving was to giving to 12 people. And he was lucky to have them because at one time everyone left. He said, Lord, where are we going to go? He said, are you going to leave me too? Because he said, you've got to drink my flesh and you've got to drink my blood. That began to separate, didn't it? Because Jesus said, he said, hey, all of you people are following me because you, I'm healing you and I'm delivering you and I'm casting the devils out of you. Now, I really want you to know why I came, is to have a relationship with you. That's right. They all took off. Yes. The 12 are still there. Are you going to leave? I mean, he was faced with the real possibility that he was going to have to start over. And they said, well, Lord, where else can we go? We're ruined. You have the words of eternal life. We're in this thing all the way. Right. We're going to go all the way with you, Lord. Wow. So how do we rate this? Is Christ a failure because he built relationships? No. Became the greatest success, the greatest individual that's ever been known in the annals of humanity was the advent of Jesus Christ coming to the earth, sowing his life into 12 people, became the nation that you are today, became who you are today. But see, the same thing that was in him is also in us, for us to create the same spirit that he brought to perpetuate that, to magnify it, to illustrate it, to walk in it, to demonstrate it, to model it. So it's never about the results. It's about what we create together. The results seem to take care of themselves, right? At least you hope so, but what if they don't? You still walk with him, don't you? Because there's nothing greater than dwelling in the house of the Lord. It's the highest place to go. Come on, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Psalms 34, 134 says, you know, behold, this is when they'd reached there. They came back and they'd reached the place. And this was the cry that came out of them. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. This people that had been created to become the Zion of God. You see, we're saying, well, let's go, all go up to Zion. Well, the Lord's saying, you're the Zion. You're the place that the word, the presence of God emanates out of you to bring his glory to the earth. Wow. Man, I like it, don't you? In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 13, 14, and 15, it says, You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you've gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast. 
you and your son and your daughter, seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you shall surely, you're not putting this up there, so that you shall surely rejoice. Everybody say, we will surely rejoice. So the Feast of Tabernacles is also a time of great rejoicing. It's a time when we literally overflow with joy. And we understand, you know, it says, I believe in the book of Nehemiah, De Deuteronomy, it also it says that when the word of the law was read, they began to lament and weep. But he said to them, hey, eat the fat, drink the sweet. Don't lament over what's happening, but rejoice over it. Because it's a sign of his presence coming to you. Book of Psalms chapter 137, verse 1 through 4. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For those who carried us away captive required of us a song. How many of you ever felt a little out of place in church when you're really not with it? Maybe that didn't include any one of you. You're really not with it, and the worship leader or the pastor gets up there and says, okay, come on, let's rejoice. Come on, let's sing a song of praise to our God. How many have ever heard that and just kind of cringed a little bit and just said, oh, if you knew what I was going through, you wouldn't require that of me. Well, see, this is what they were saying. We, here, we were captured in Babylon, yet you're telling us to rejoice. You're telling us to sing one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? When you're brought back and God's anointing restores you, there's nothing but melody singing for joy in your heart. You know, the Bible says that we go for a season weeping. We go for a season crying out. But doubtless, when the morning comes, we will rejoice in our God. So when you're going through these times of darkness in your life, sadness, lament, crying out, hurt, pain, it's very difficult. What do you do? You turn and get in your booth. Get into the banner of the Lord. Because when the anointing comes, it'll break every yoke. It'll liberate you from your captivity. When the Jesus comes, your sins are forgiven. Your bondage is no longer. And in your heart will be a song of joy. It's a time, the Lord said, sound the trumpet, blow a trumpet in Zion. The joy of the Lord is your strength. In the fullness of his presence, there's joy. Wow. I know if you're like I am, I don't want to have to work up my joy. You know, I'm standing here like an old turnip and someone comes and shakes me. And I've done this to some of you guys. Shake, get, get happy. Come on, get happy. Doesn't that irritate you? Well, believe me, I'd be happy if I could be happy. <laughs> I mean, I'm in a place that I can't be happy. But I, but I can tell you this, when the anointing comes, mm, whew, out of my deepest brokenness, out of my deepest despair, out of my deepest pain, out of my deepest hurt, has always come the greatest joy. Because in every one of those instances I've turned to the God of light and the God of anointing and the God of presence and the God of love and the God of forgiveness. And every time 
results in the joy of the Lord coming out of my life. There's times I've had to crawl in. There's times I've, I don't know, maybe I'm an extreme case. You probably haven't had these problems, but I've had so many problems where I've been like miserable. But then his presence comes. Hmm. when their presence comes all of a sudden I can't even hardly remember the, my captivity and it's not long until it's all taken away that's what the Lord said he would do with your captivity he would remove it from your midst Psalms 126 verse 1 says 126 verse 1 through 3 when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Therefore, we will be glad. <clears throat> it's a time of the joy of the Lord. I don't care where you're at this morning in this process. Just turn and start marching back to Zion. Start marching back to the beautiful city of our God. The one that's set upon a hill. Keep coming back to that place where the refreshing presence of the Lord comes. It says in the book of Acts, it says, repent. And the Lord said, I will send a spirit of refreshing from Jesus Christ. He'll come to you. Lord, I'm trapped in this place of unbelief and fear and anxiety. Lord says, just turn away from that and come back to me. And I'll put a song in your heart, a, a dance in your step. <laughs> we were up here last week. I make a fool of myself. Took my boots off and some of us were up dancing, some of the guys. And thank you guys for coming up and diverting some of the attention from me. I can't help it. I was dancing like a Jewish guy, you know. I mean, some of you look and say, well, look at that old guy up there dancing. What's he trying to do? I don't know. I, I get the glory on me. I can't help it. All of a sudden, I just want to praise him. There's freedom. See, I, don't, I want the worship that's birthed out of the spontaneous interaction with God. It's called the halal worship. It's the root word of hallelujah. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say it like a Pentecostal. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, brother. Hallelujah. The root word of hallelujah is halal, which means the loud, spontaneous praise of the Lord. Now, what creates a spontaneous combustion? The mixing of two elements, right? When you mix two elements together in certain elements, they create a spontaneous combustion. It's not a smart thing to do if you're taking chemistry, right? In college, okay, I'm going to mix this with this, and I know they're going to explode when I mix them. And so they explode, and you're no longer. Well, it's kind of that way with the Lord. When you take, when you take your heart and present it to the living God, you position yourself for a spontaneous combustion to take place in your life. Woo! Woo. Woo. Spontaneous combustion. For out of you comes a loud, spontaneous praise unto the Lord. So wherever you're at in this process, if you bring you to the anointing, it'll create a spontaneous combustion 
in you. It'll create something that cannot be contained within you. When the day of Pentecost fully came, 120 were gathered in the upper room, presenting themselves in one accord. It said they were in one accord with the Lord. They were worshiping in one accord. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, like a rushing mighty wind, and clothes of tongues of fire settled upon them, and the place they were in began to shake. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And out of that spontaneous combustion on the day of Pentecost, wow, Woo. a nation was born in one day. A people were released in one day. Jesus was brought to the world in one day. When we, the church, enter into this full tabernacling of the Lord, we'll create a combustible force that will change the world. It's the difference between a Babylonian church and a Zion church. Do you, know, you know in Babylon they got to worship? They didn't restrict them from worshiping. They didn't stop them from being Israelis, Jewish people. But they couldn't be combustible because they didn't come back to the house, to the temple of the Lord. Somewhere, somehow, someday, there's got to be a people upon the earth. that encounter him in such a way that it transforms the world. You say, well, I thought we were doing that. Well, we are, but we're not. We're not fully there. I don't think there's any shame in saying that we're not fully there to you. I think the shame would be in saying that we are there, but we're not. I think the true thing to say is that, Lord, we're only, we're only moving forward to where you want us to be. We will not keep silent. We will not draw back until you establish Jerusalem as a praise upon the earth. We are the people of the Lord. I've got to quit. I've only got down to two points out of the seven. Sorry, Bill. I didn't make it. I didn't get to the good part. But kind of did. Kind of the good part, right? Lord, help us in this hour just to be diligent, to be like David. Just keep crying out, Lord. I wish I'd got the Hebrews over where it does say it's finished. The Lord has completed this, but he said, now I'm waiting for you to enter into it. I want you to come into this place. He said, there's a door set before you. There's a place that reserved in heaven for you. You have been called to enter in to his rest. Just as he ceased from his works, you'll also cease from yours in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. We give you praise. We magnify you, Lord. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Father. You're awesome, oh God. Thank you, Lord. I think a few people are gonna say a few things this morning. Just, let's just confirm this word in our hearts today. And I swear, I'll get to the other five points there, Bill, eventually. Thank you, Father. 
yeah, the Lord just says, come home, come home, come home. I just bless all of you in Jesus' name. I just declare that you're going to come home. Mm -hmm. Amen. We just declare that one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. So we just stomp on a spirit of slumber and we just come forth and arise as a body of Christ in this hour. We are willing. We are willing and we open our hearts and we say, welcome home. Yes. Lord, we receive you. We receive your dwelling presence. Lord, live with us. Amen. Be with us. Yes. Ascend us. We receive your love. We live with you. We receive your joy. Amen. Good. Good. When Aaron speaks, we listen. We open wide our door. We are the people who are the dwelling place of the Lord. So, Lord, that you would have your way in us to create and establish Zion here, your dwelling place. Pastor Bill didn't understand why he mentioned the Beatles, and he said, this music is going to change the world. And I think he was prophesying over his own house that the worship, that the tabernacle that we make for God is going to change worship through the world. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Affirm the word and just declare that we are the trumpets of Zion and that um, we just prepare the way of the Lord, that we are his dwelling place. Amen. Lord, we establish our hearts as a, as a habitation for your presence, Lord. Yes. We purpose in our hearts to make our, our, our homes, our hearts of not only our physical bodies, but our homes and, and our families, a habitation of the presence of the Lord. Yes. During worship, um, towards the end of worship, um, God just kept showing me this huge, and I mean, I can't even describe how big this vat and it was just the anointing oil that God has, that God has created this huge vat of anointed oil. And during worship, it just seemed like we were just hitting the sides of it and rocking it and rolling it just a little bit. And a little bit would splash out here and would splash out there. And we've seen that kind of anointing. But God's, my heart's cry is that God let us dump that tub over. And that's, that's a passion that God just put in my heart during worship. But we just going to spill that tub out and let it just flow. Amen. Thank you, Father. We won't be those that worship God with all of our hearts, but all alone. We'll tabernacle, tabernacle together as God intended, worshiping God with all of, all of our hearts. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen. Let's all stand up. Wow. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> just hold your hands up in the presence this morning. I just pray that every one of you here will feel the anointing of the Lord upon your body today, upon your mind, your heart. May his presence be with you today. May his glory dwell and rest upon you in weight, like a weight of glory. Let it come upon you right now, Father. We ask you to come upon all of us in your presence. Lord, we just yield our hearts to the vision of the tabernacle, to the day of the Lord upon the earth. Lord, let us be a, a part of this great throng of people that you're raising up all over this world to be your people, to stand in your house and to praise your name and to magnify and exalt who you are to the world around us. Lord, we receive it today in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just proclaim today over everyone here that also that you'll have an atonement experience, that there'll be no, no condemnation over you, no lamenting or thinking about the past and the things you were that you weren't. But every one of you here can say, I have a clean slate. I have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. He's removed all of my transgressions as far as the east and the west and he's cast them into the sea of forgetfulness.
I refuse to walk in condemnation. I refuse to walk in a sense that I cannot do and be what God wants me to be because that's a lie. You, you, God has spoken the truth to you today. He has set you free to walk in the full expression of who he is. This is your day. It's the day of the Lord for every one of you. In the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.